And uh, I'd like to now introduce our second distinguished speaker. We have Dr. Celine Heinel with the Federal Institute for Risk Assessment. That is the BFR in Germany, in Berlin. Hello, Celine. Can you hear me there? Hello, David. Yes, I can hear you fine. <laughs> Wonderful. I just wanted to give a, a brief introduction. The BFR, for those that don't know, has the task of providing scientific advice to the German government on issues relating to food safety, product safety, chemical safety, contaminants in the food chain, animal protection, and consumer health protection. So it really is helping us uh, keep healthy and making sure that what we eat and consume is safe. Yeah, and today, Celine will be talking about the idea of pre-registration, how to bring transparency into animal research. When it comes to animal experiments, several studies indicate that a large part of animal experiments are never published. This non-publication not only leads to a distorted view of the state of research, but also strongly contradicts ethical principles. This is the reason they propose a pre-registration system to improve transparency and animal welfare at the same time. So, Guten Morgen, Celine. If I'm not mistaken, you are in the beautiful city of Berlin, our capital, correct? Yes, correct. I'm in Berlin now. Super. I ask all of our speakers, maybe just, I know Berlin has probably dozens and dozens of highlights. One highlight for you, for the city of Berlin? <laughs> Multiple. I wouldn't say a special area, but perhaps just the atmosphere in a lot of different areas I really like and I enjoy. Yes. I have to laugh because in Washington, D.C., we call that a very diplomatic answer. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent. Then wonderful, Celine. Uh, the digital stage is yours. And again, around 20 minutes, and then afterwards we'll have a few, a few minutes for Q&A. Please go ahead. Thank you, David, for the introduction. And uh, thank you also for the organizers for inviting me and uh, presenting our platform, the Animal Study Registry, to an open science community, which we uh, yeah, are, not, are not used to. Usually we present in front of uh, laboratory animal scientists. And uh, so I'm very happy to show you today why we think we need uh, pre-registration in animal research and how this can on one side improve uh, research quality, but also improve animal welfare at the same time. Because uh, David, you said in the introduction, I'm working at the BFR, but the, um, so we are uh, yeah, working on risk assessment. But here's also the place for the uh, center of a German center for the protection of laboratory animals. And that is actually our goal. And that's why we created this, um, this pre-registry. And so I would like to really start at the very beginning. So the ethical challenge and um, animal experiments are still a very controversial topic in our society and already children, small children, really refuse the instinctive legal concept of animal testing. However, at the same time, we still need animal experiments to advance medicine and also to guarantee uh, safety for, consumer, uh, and for consumers. And um, so there is a legal framework allowing, um, allowing animal experiments under certain condi conditions and just under the assumption that this will bring knowledge gain to our society. However, now here comes the problem that, um, as was said in the introduction, a large part of animal research is probably never published. And now what are we talking about? What is the quantity? What is the number of animal experiments that are not published? This is actually quite difficult to find out, but there were several attempts which I would like to show you to yeah, kind of find out <laughs> what is the part um, of non-publication. And there was one study trying in 2012 to assess um, the publication rate by a survey on, uh, for among animal researchers in the Netherlands. And they ask, what do they believe that overall is the part of animal experiments that are published? And the median response was 50%, which I find actually quite shocking. And when they were asked what was the percentage they believe uh, the, their experiments uh, are published, they said 80%. I think that's quite typical. The others are always doing worse. But in general, both are actually quite high numbers. So 20% of non-publication is already, I find, a significant part. And in the last year, there were two more studies with the, with the 
um, both used a similar approach to find a bit more objectively um, what is the quantity of uh, non-publication of animal research and they um, followed up animal study protocols. This means that every scientist who wants to perform animal experiments need to um, write an animal study protocol with a little bit of background and uh, how many animals they want to use and why do they need to perform these experiments. And um, then the competent authority can permit this uh, study protocol and um, uh, yeah, <laughs> and this they try to follow up and look at the any, uh, at the study protocols. How many of these protocols led to a publication in the end? And what they found out is on two German uh, university medical centers that only 67% of these uh, uh, protocols led to a publication. And if you would uh, not take into account doctoral thesis, this number would even drop to 58%. And uh, Another study, oh, sorry, I used the wrong remote. <laughs> Another study from the Netherlands did in a similar way now in Utrecht. They also followed up um, study protocols and looked at more than six years after application, how many led to a publication. And they found a similar number that only 60% of these animal study protocols actually led to at least one publication. And they even counted abstract abstracts. And they also looked at not only just the publication for one whole protocol, but they really looked at individual animal numbers. And there they found out that only 26 of animals uh, which were written in the study protocol were reported in the end in the publication. I think it's quite hard still to really put a number on the problem, but I think all agreed, even in the survey, everybody said there is a large part which is not published, so we're really dealing with a problem. And now, of course, come the important question, what is the reason for this? And I think it's uh, probably a reason you all know also from different fields of research. The main reason, which was also said in the survey, is a publication bias. So there's a strong incentive uh, for, for positive finding. It's easier to publish. And that negative findings are simply often not recorded, uh, reported. And the second uh, reason were all reasons um, uh, around technical issues in the experiments. And I think both reasons are actually uh, things which should be reported to the broad scientific community to really make uh, medical progress and uh, to learn out of these experiments. Because um, the non-publication will, of course, have all these uh, an ethical concern. I mean, all these experiments are just permitted under the assumption that they will bring gain of knowledge. And this is simply not happening if they are not reported to a broad scientific community. And this can also lead then again to unnecessary duplication of experiments in different labs. And all of this leads, of course, also to waste of public money because most uh, research is still publicly funded and um, to an and could also explain an insufficient translation of biomedical research into clinical research later. Uh, there's a lot of failures when it comes to effectiveness of drugs. This might also be due, of course, to this publication bias um, and uh, leaving experiments out. So now uh, enough to the problem, but really we need to find a solution. And um, that is why it was uh, proposed in beginning of 2010 that similar to clinical research, it could might help to tackle or one, one uh, possibility to tackle this problem would be animal study registries. So similar to what is already done in clinical research to um, ask scientists to, before they start any experiment, fix their study plan and uh, register it in a public registry. And then afterwards, it allows uh, the comparison between what was actually in the original plan and what is published later, or whether there is any publication later. So this would help, of course, to encourage the publication of all gained result and then, then not only diminish the size of the publication bias, but also just um, tackle all the ethical issues I was talking in the beginning. 
and it could help fight the p-hacking. So this is uh, still quite common practice in biomedical research to try to uh, keep the p-value low to a significant level by using the flexibility of analysis. So, um, but now in a pre-registration, if you would um, fix in advance the, the sample size, or, and exclusion criteria, the variables, and the uh, statistical tests, it becomes nearly impossible to perform p-hacking. Then it would help to clearly distinguish which parts of a study are, are hypothesis generation and which ones are hypothesis testing. So there wouldn't be any harking, so hypothesizing after results are known, and um, would help to later really uh, assess what what is the validity of the outcome um, and it uh, promotes at an early time point now the planning of the study and supports the scientists in planning their study and take into account all the important points of a well-designed study and in the end it would promote research transparency and also help to regain trust in research which i think which i think is especially nowadays very important as we can see And um, why do we believe it's true? Uh, it would work is because we know from clinical trial registries that it exists already since uh, 20 years. In um, 2000, early 2000, the FDA and the NIH launched the clinical trial registry, tree, which is still one of the biggest registries um, for clinical trials, and um, uh, it became now also mandatory for most of clinical trials to register their study in the public registry. And there's already some studies showing that this led to an increase in the reporting of null results. So this might also happen then to animal uh, studies. So here is a study from 2015 where they looked at all, uh, it was, a, uh, they looked at studies um, uh, evaluating treatment treatments for uh, cardiovascular diseases and they uh, put some different categories whether the result was in the end uh, harmful, null or uh, beneficial, so the treatment they tested. And you can easily see that before 2000 you have the majority of studies reported a beneficial effect for the treatment they tested. And after the year 2000, uh, for these studies to uh, receive some funding, it became uh, mandatory to register in the clinical uh, trial registry. And you can easily see that there's a clear drop in beneficial effects and you have a lot of null results. So I guess this might also happen if registration, uh, pre-registration would happen in animal registries. And all of this brought us to the uh, idea that we should have an animal study registry and we launched it in 2019. So here at the uh, BFR, it is uh, for all studies around the world which involve any kind of animals. And um, if you're curious, just have a look. You can browse through the page and th through our registries without, an without creating any account. This is just if you want to uh, register a study. And um, so if you register a study, we ask for some details about your study, your st uh, especially for the study design, also your method and the statistical analysis, and also some details about the animals used and uh, the housing conditions and if you are using any refinement measures. And I would like to quickly run you through our registration process. So if you... Um, developed any idea on what you want to investigate, you can enter your study in our form and then the study is submitted. And after submission, you still have two weeks to retract your study or to add any changes. It's only after two weeks that the study gets automatically registered. And when it's registered, it receives a DOI, so a digital object identifier, and you cannot change anything anymore but it becomes also citable from this uh, time point on. And this doesn't mean that it's immediately public. You have the option of, for up to five years to um, 
to choose an embargo, which means that your study will only be visible with a title, um, the institution where it's performed, and a short abstract, and optionally the name, optionally the name of the author. But we, of course, know that uh, you f fix a study plan, but a lot of changes can happen. And for this, we uh, give the opportunity to, opportunity to add um, comments where you can account for any protocol changes or even if you need to stop the study. This is also an information which would be important and which you could add in the comments. And in the end, these comments will also help you to link any data sets or publication resulting from this registration. And usually I said in the uh, very beginning that we present uh, a lot to animal research scientists and we get a lot of positive feedback, but still also a lot of concerns. And one of the main concerns I would say is that um, most animal um, uh, science is still exp uh, is still exploratory basic science that's where most animals are used and that uh, scientists say it's to, it's not flexible and that they uh, cannot plan their study to the same extent and we would say um, you can really you don't need to to register a whole study like it would be later in a publication but you can really also register small study parts and change it uh, and and just build up on it and uh, register small parts which you can just you can always just copy a study and change the parts which need to be changed um and sorry for the delay <laughs> um also, of course, there's always a question of scientific freedom, but I think by registering small parts and by really using also our comment fu function where you can uh, explain any any changes, I think it's still very, uh, you're still very free in your research. And of course, all of this also takes time. So this is, uh, I think, just a practical reason why some uh, uh, scientists are concerned. But I think if you, really pre-register in the beginning of your study, you will save time in the end because now also most journals uh, already enrolled some reporting guidelines, the ARRIVE guideline, and most of these things which you need to fill out later to, to write a manuscript are already asked now in our pre-registry, and so you will save time later. And of course, there are always concerns about intellectual property, but I think with our five-year embargo, we're actually on the good side. And also, um, I think it's more, you, you can even help with the DOI to really show that your, <laughs> that your, um, your study is, was, uh, the idea came already very early. You have a time stamp for, for the generation of your idea. So, of course, we, I see there, was, uh, there, there are a lot of concerns still from the animal scientist community. So we really need to work on creating incentives. So um, we discuss with funding agencies, with universities and with journals to really try to, to advance uh, pre-registration animal research. That's our uh, main work at the moment. And um, so now just to come to an end um, I think it would be if you're interested just have a look at our our registry we also wrote some publications uh, on it so if you want to know more about details and um, so we are federal institute is perhaps also important so we are independent of sponsoring which makes also our registry tree quite sustainable and uh, with this, I'm really happy to take your questions. And if you have further questions also, of course, in the meet the speaker session. And thank you for your attention. And thank you for your wonderful presentation, Celine. Uh, I just wanted to make a quick announcement. We had several questions regarding your slides. There's a lot of interest in the slides. So I just wanted to remind everyone, all the slides, they're available on Zenado. Uh, that's again, all slides are available on Zenodo. So thank you for the questions on that. Yeah, we have a few minutes time for some Q&A, so I'll jump right into it. Um, Celine, the first question we have is, how do you want to motivate the researchers to pre-register their work? Is there any way of positive motivation or must it be done mainly by funder rules? I think, I mean, we try to just convince them by talking, uh, by really going to the scientists and giving presentations and really it's quite a new topic in, in uh, most labs. 
So um, sometimes it helps, I think especially among young scientists to just uh, try some uh, convincing um, work. But of course, we also want to try to create really incentives. So via the funding agencies, as was said, then also by talking to journals, which sometimes also put it already in guidelines to really also support uh, pre-registration and uh, also by universities. I mean, there were already uh, universities who just gave up uh, some money to uh, for for pre-registration of studies but I think of course it's nice to count on free will but uh, incentives are uh, of course important yeah absolutely absolutely our, our next question is the aim that only pre-registered studies can be published how to prevent stealing of ideas or researchers registering a lot of ideas so that others can't work on them um, yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, publish <laughs> uh, to make it mandatory to publish a study, we're still it's still quite a long way. I mean, people first need to know that they can pre-register a study. So at the beginning, especially for journals, which just be to really acknowledge that people made the effort to to try this open science uh, way, and um, uh, to why we. Yeah, of course, you can always try to to I would say cheat by um, um, by just uh, registering uh, plenty of ideas. But after five years, people would see that you just registered a lot of ideas, and if there's never a publication, perhaps the community will ask some questions. So I think yeah. this would be kind of a self-regulation within the scientific community. I would hope. Yeah. But that's okay, a good thanks. question. We also thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Great, our next question uh, is from Marcus Konkal, and he's asking, uh, why not going for registered reports, peer-reviewed pre-registration? This would help to tackle the fear of being scooped and publication bias, or do journals in your field not provide this option? There's registered report, the option of registered report. I think it's a very good option and very important. Also, it's still not very common in our field, but uh, it starts uh, uh, being there. I think both has has advantages. The problem with registered fields, I think what we have perhaps is more flexibility. You can mm -hmm. register smaller studies, really come back and add some changes. And um, you don't need to, to already in the beginning first to fix the journal where you want to uh, to to publish and you can uh, yeah you have more flexibility by, by registering several things and deciding later what you want to put in one uh, publication. And the second thing, especially for scooping, I think, um, I mean, registered reports still <laughs> is a problem you, you registering. Uh, you, you Perhaps I think there are still some concerns uh, might be that you, you send your idea to uh, ex other experts from the field. And it's not clear that your 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 registered report is already accepted. So mm -hmm. this might also be something where uh, we have uh, yeah an advantage because it's uh, basically no one will see it uh, in the first five years or just the things you want to say. So in the abstract, which you can still keep quite vague. So I think, but of course, uh, registered reports are great, especially to uh, also work on publication bias. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, got you. Uh, we have time for two more quick questions. I'd ask you if you can keep the answers brief because it's really fantastic here. Besides the pre-registration of studies, should it also be mandatory to publish the data for all animal studies, also for negative results without any published paper? Yeah, would be great, of course, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we're we are far, yeah, we are fast. Yeah, still, it's not mandatory, but I think, yeah, this is what we want because, of course, making a publication is always writing a publication is always also some work. So now I think that also in our pre-registry, just ask for links for data sets or something, just to leave a trace for the scientific community. It mm. doesn't need to always be just a publication. Yeah. Okay. Super. And the final question here: um, How do you communicate these improvements to the public? And then we have a hashtag science. Hashtag science communication. That's also an excellent question. I think um, it's still pre-registration is still a bit complicated, but we also try. I mean, especially for our we are a center which uh, works also with um, yeah just the protection of laboratory animals, and we do a lot of communication on just animal experiments and uh, to show that it's still a very difficult position to take on, and what can be done to to ensure animal welfare. Um, 
pre-registration. We also did some press releases or something, but um, it's still quite a complex topic. Um, but of course, yeah, it's uh, always good to talk to the public. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and with that, um, our final question, we do have our speakers session coming up. Will you be available for that? And if so, do you have a time already that you know? Yes, I'm looking forward to it. It's at 12.15, so in 15 minutes, I will okay, be Okay, 15 minutes, Central European yeah. time.